Let's stay with this. South Africa has a progressive constitution and laws to protect human rights. But the implementation of those laws has often been lacking. 25 years since the dawn of democracy, South Africa remains one of the most unequal nations in the world. Well, ahead of those elections in May, Amnesty International calling on all the parties to put human rights at the centre of their policies. Otherwise, it says the chains of unemployment and poverty could remain tight for decades. It presented a human rights manifesto for South Africa, that report we were talking about, tracking our progress across 25 years. The manifesto highlights eight issues that Amnesty International considers important, uh, important for parties and candidates to commit to, including the right to health, quality education, as well as upholding the rights of asylum seekers. To discuss, we're joined by Amnesty International's media officer, Minka Staitler. Thank you for being with us, uh, Minka. Thank you for having me. So, so let's start with climate change. Uh, we're mm -hmm. Naida was saying, I see that's one of the eight. Uh, it's, it's not in your top three, but it, it's one of them. And I guess the floods putting everything into relief. Absolutely. We all woke up this morning and to terrible reports of over 50 people leaving, uh, losing their lives. And now tonight 60. it's gone up to 60, exactly. And for us, it is a human rights issue. These are the right to life, but there are also people who have lost their entire homes all their belongings and for us this is a very very stark example of what could be to come if we don't take climate change seriously mm. and often people have thought about it as an environmental issue you know some recycling but actually what we're saying as Amnesty International now is that there is a hu massive human rights human dignity angle and aspect to climate change and it needs to be addressed. There, there is a small party, the Green Party, but if you, yeah. look, if you look at the manifestos, uh, even besides climate change, I don't think human rights are very central. Are you disappointed by that? We are disappointed by that. We do think that South Africa still has uh, the burden of inequality and unemployment and um, poverty and we feel that actually human rights should be at the forefront it should be the priority you already mentioned it but you know things like the right to education the right to health and uh, the way that refugees are treated and even the you know the way that um, South Africa's role in foreign policy or in the region and we feel that we are disappointed because we would love to see much more talk around human rights but concrete action plans with timelines and deliverables and obviously also inclusive so we we are happy to engage not just us but civil society in general and what are these challenges and what are the solutions but before we look at some of the points you want the parties to consider what about now the new face of the ANC because you, you talk about the fact that our, we had this great human rights track record then it changed and yes our government protected Omar al-Bashir that 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 has come out yes um, we, we decided to leave the international uh, court, uh, the, the Hague. However, things are changing. What, what do you, how do you assess the, the current regime under Cyril Ramaphosa? We are actually filled with hope. We, we, he had, for example, looking at violence against women and gender non-conforming people, uh, uh, sexual and uh, gender-based violence is a huge issue for us. And he's already showing steps towards addressing this, for example. So we are hopeful that under his leadership, even things where he's talked about, um, you know, the right to education, the pit latrine, uh, pit toilet issue as well. So we are filled with hope, but we keep saying that it needs to be followed up with concrete plans. But these plans, when they're made, have to include the organizations, and this is not just us, there are so many organizations working on the ground on these issues, that has to include the consultation of these communities, of the organizations, to put concrete plans into, in, in, with timelines where we can, you know, hold account, how's the progress going mm. and really address these so issues. So I'm glad you raised pit latrines uh, because mm. the, the president then took on that issue. Um, there, there was a lot of hoo-ha around that. Mm. But, but I understand that recently Amnesty International has looked at a whole lot of provinces. What is the situation? Yeah, we've actually been spending about two years traveling around South Africa.
Africa. That research will be out a little bit later this year. But what we have seen on the ground is actually quite shocking. Um, access to sanitation being almost non-existent, especially when you go into provinces like the Eastern Cape. And then also looking at uh, resources like textbooks and the overcrowding of classrooms. Our researchers saw it with their own eyes. Mm. We, we, as an organization, we don't go on uh, second-hand or third-hand reports. We actually go to what we call the field and we have a look. So what we have seen is that the challenge is huge. Of course, there's a lot more access. Many, many more children actually go to school. We have a lot more people actually finishing school. So there has been you know, some progress in some areas, but now we're saying we also need to look at the challenges and not shy away from it anymore and, and work together as government, civil society, teachers, parents, students, for example, in education now, um, to really solve these issues. Mm. And, and we've heard a lot of the excuses around resources, money, maybe that is a problem. But for, for you, 25 years on, is it acceptable to still have pit latrines? No, it's not acceptable at all. Of course, we understand that there are issues. And of course, we understand that, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. But it's getting to the stage now where we're saying, well, is another year going to go by and another year and another year? And are we going to sit here in another 25 years and still have the same issues? The time has run out. It's over now. And, uh, and we really need to look at what the priorities are and how can we work to make life, a dignified life for every single person in South Africa. All right, so that's one of the top three, uh, education for mm -hmm. all. Another one, the right to health for all. Uh, what, what is the roadmap to get there? We know such shocking instances in, in hospitals. We won't even talk about life. Yeah. Government uh, currently seems to believe that the map is the national health insurance. Yes, so we are... We are actually looking at the research for that as well, looking at what the map exactly says and how it can be implemented. Because you mentioned earlier that we have these wonderful laws, many, many wonderful laws that can uphold many of these rights, but they're just not implemented the way that they should. And of course, we don't want the NHI to go that way either. So we are hopeful, but uh, we are also you know, reserving judgment for now, just because we've seen this before we've seen the development of fantastic laws that might have an initial positive impact but then are not implemented pr properly and we end up just sitting with the same mm. challenges so we're hopeful about the NHI but we are our researchers are on the case and it'll be interesting to see how it goes forward as it's rolled out. I, I've asked the health minister this before but is there any danger that we're focusing on the future on a national health insurance when we do have a public system right now that should help everybody and that should be working and should be working and existing hospitals that should be resourced and that should be you know have the staff that they need already and we say this with education as well instead of building new schools why are we not fixing the schools we have you know let's let's fix the the system that we have as well and let's look at the way the best way that resources in particular can be used so that people can go and get the services they need in order mm. to be healthy. Well, one of the, the things you've called for, safe abortions, uh, and, and this is interesting because there are many new parties and some of them religious in nature, yeah. um, and, and some of them riding on an anti-abortion ticket. Yeah. What would your message to them be? Our message is that, uh, one, of course we understand also where they're coming from, but our message is one of human rights. When you look at the statistics, when you look at the number of women who actually die because of botched backstreet abortions, then it's actually very shocking. If you look at young women who are in abusive situations as well and being able to access safe and legal, and it is legal in South Africa, this is actually one of the fantastic laws we have, but it's not implemented properly. If you look at the statistics of the number of people who end up very sick or dead because they went and they sought uh, an alternative way of terminating a pregnancy, then you can see the stark reality of what some people's lived realities are and, mm. uh, and how desperate they are. And then the human rights really, really is very important to take into account. Well, in fact, you found that only 7% mm. of health facilities offered abortion. So in a country where abortion is legal, is this where South Africa, in a sense, is ignoring its own laws? Yes, there's an issue around, um, there is a, a 
So health professionals can um, conscientiously choose, yeah. and choose, but uh, they are then supposed to refer someone on. And what we're finding is that often doesn't happen. Or a lot of the reports that young women come with us to us with is that they feel shamed and um, very upset, and therefore they don't go back. To, the, to any clinic anywhere mm. and they choose an alternative uh, way of trying to deal with their situation and as I said that often has dire, dire so consequences. So backstreet abortions, abandonment. And, and you know like of course we understand that some people have uh, other views but um, something that someone said to us was you know what my I can't judge some someone else's life or someone else's life experience on my own life experience mm. and that one must always try and put yourself in the shoes of someone else and see the challenges that they're facing in their daily lives. Another thing you'd like politicians to uh, commit to is to uphold refugee and asylum seeker rights. So, so the DA talking about stronger borders. Um, I've looked at some of the smaller party manifestos mentioning foreigners specifically. One mm. of them wants, wants foreigners to leave. I'd like to know your opinion. Uh, to what extent does the rhetoric, because some politicians say, oh, we're just talking and we're saying, you know, it's fine if you're legal, not fine if you're, you're not. We're, we're just addressing a problem. Mm. But to what extent can rhetoric lead to violence? And we've seen violence in this country before. We've actually seen it ourselves. I mean, the flare-ups of xenophobia every now and again. And we've actually been quite shocked to see some of the rhetoric and narrative that's gone out, in particular uh, during electioneering mm. to which we think is vote gaining on um, you know which then leads to violence and deaths and people losing their homes we also know from experience our researchers have actually been to the refugee reception offices those that are open um, we obviously are doing a call that they should all be reopened again and we know of refugees who might at this moment be uh, not be legal as such but really want to be they queue there from 4 a.m. in the morning under dangerous circumstances outside Side, and then once they're inside, there are other challenges that they're facing. Yeah. So even when they're trying to be legal, there's still issues within the system that is actually stopping them from being legal. So we feel that um, the rights of refugees should really be respected and leaders must be so, so responsible about what they say. Well, well you've actually been following this since 2008. So mm. the first flare-up of, of real violence when 60 mm. people were the killed. So, violence, so the yeah. same as, as dying in, in floods today. Uh, have things gotten better or worse? Uh, can, you, can you give me an overview of uh, the, the climate when it comes to our treatment of other human beings yeah. who happen to be foreigners? And we have to remember that South Africa, many, many people sought refuge in some of these countries during the apartheid years. So, you know, it, it's something that's so important. We haven't seen much change at all. In fact, we've seen it possibly get worse and worse, in particular the sort of talk that you hear. And um, we, we also think that a lot of organizations, not just ours have made recommendations on looking at the root causes of this a lot of you know what, what can be done about unemployment mm. how can we really fix our refugee asylum seeker process application process and in the 10 well it's been 11 years it'll be 11 years in fact now at the beginning of May mm. since that initial huge flare-up of course it happened before that as well but we haven't actually seen any concrete change and um, and a lot of refugees we speak to tell us that they just feel very scared and um, some of them would love to go home but in fact they can't go home because home is is even worse. Yes, yeah, so a desperate, so situation. desperate situation. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you very much. So an appeal to politicians, put human rights first. That was Minka Statler, Amnesty International's South Africa media officer.